Good afternoon, church. It's so good to see all of you here today. Just want to extend a big welcome to all the friends who have chosen, chosen to join us. Okay, we are so glad they are here with us. Come, let's ask the Lord to speak to us this afternoon. Lord, we want to give thanks to you for gathering us here together as a spiritual family once more. Uh, even, and in this moment, Lord, we want to remember and be thankful that, God, we do not uh, worship and follow an idea or philosophy that was being passed down by some other people in the, by people in the past. But Lord, we worship a real person, oh God, a living, a living God, and you know, on whom we can place all our hopes, all our dreams, and all our fears, oh God. So this afternoon, even as we uh, come and exp- uh, find out together, explore, discover together what is the God-given purpose uh, to each and every one of us, I pray that God, you will come and speak to us, uh, give us a message that is intimate and personal. Holy Spirit, invite your friends to be here with us this afternoon, God. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How would you like it if you could stop working in your stressful jobs and just lie down at home all day, every day? Anybody wants that? Only one honest person, the rest are... Okay. Okay, I'm sure, right? Even if you don't raise your hand, many of you are already fantasizing about that right now, right? No more unreasonable bosses, no more unhelpful colleagues, or no more unrealistic timeline, only uninterrupted rest. Okay, this is in fact a social movement that is fast gaining traction in China. The Tangping, okay, some of you know this, right? The Tangping or the lying flat movement is a phenomenon whereby young millennials and Gen Zs, working adults, are forsaking personal ambition, foregoing the pursuit of material wealth, and embracing minimalistic living. Okay, some examples of the Tangping way of life include not getting married, not having children, not buying a car or a house, just stay with your parents all for the rest of your life, refusing to work extra hours, and in more extreme cases, not to hold a full-time job at all. Now, before all the adults in the earlier generations start criticizing all these young people for being lazy, unmotivated strawberries, they consider, they are, consider this situation from their point of view. Okay, the job market in China is so competitive that it is said that for every one position in the civil service, 100 candidates are applying for it. Wow, for every one position, 100 people are applying for it. Okay, and we know this in the news, right? Because of the China and US trade war, increasing global competition means that companies must now remain vigilant lest they get overtaken by competitors. Okay, consequently, a culture of overtime work prevails. Okay, and it becomes very, very hard for all the millions of people to see. It becomes very hard for them to swallow this. Okay, because they have been slaving away in the 996 work culture. You know what's 996? Right, from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m., six days a week. Wow, think about that. Right, so for all these young people, for all these people, even though they are working so much, you know something? They still can't afford a home. They still can't afford child raising. Okay, and because of that, you know, when they look at, 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 at in things in totality to save themselves from being crushed by the stress and pressure, they have opted to unplug themselves from the rat race and to lower their standard of living so that they can get by life with minimal effort and minimal stress. Actually, if you think about it, from their point of view, uh, this philosophy makes sense, right? You live a stress-free life by disconnecting yourself from the sources of stress, right? You don't, you, you don't have to stress about buying a car, buying a house. You don't have to stress about, stress about all the things that people are, are worrying about. Okay, but as observers, right? All of us are observers, right? Ob- observers of this phenomenon. Okay, we got to ask, is this way of life viable? <laughs> is this a viable way of life? Okay, let me ask you. Would you choose to quit your job that is causing you so much stress and anxiety? Okay, I know some of you are re- you know, think about quitting your job every day, right? <laughs> Would you opt for a job that is much lower in pay, but a lot more manageable and flexible? Would you do that? Would you choose, listen to this, huh? would you choose to downgrade your lifestyle? Meaning, a uh, smaller house, right? 
no car. Right? Only have holidays within Southeast Asia. Japan, not Southeast Asia. Huh? <laughs> when you eat Thai fun, don't buy fish. Right? Will you choose to lower your lifestyle so that you can live with a much lower salary? Will you do that? If not, why not? You say stress, ma. Why wouldn't you want to lower your, your standard of living? You see, having more money does not lower your stress. Right? For those of us who have been working for a few years now, we know this, right? The greater your wealth, the more sources of stress you have. So wouldn't you want to have a stress-free lifestyle? I think one important point to note is that for most of us Singaporeans, we will not subscribe to this Tang Ping philosophy. Right? We will not subscribe to it, not because we are more resilient than the Chinese, but because our friends you know, in China genuinely feel that there is no point in working so hard. Right? That's their predicament. Right? There's really no point working so hard. It will not make their lives better. So the real issue here right, in this movement does not lie with the stress, but the outcome. Okay, and I think the learning point for us is this. Okay, we, all of us, we know that there are certain things in life that are worth fighting for. We can put up with great amount of stress and pain if the end goal is worth it. If working harder means we can secure a better life for ourselves and for our loved ones, we will gladly do it. If working harder means we can make a difference to the life of others, we will gladly do it. If working harder means we can make our world, our society a better place, we will gladly do it. So the, our struggle is not with having too much stress, but having too small a purpose. Our struggle is not with having too much stress, but too small a purpose. Now, is there a big enough purpose for us to live for? Is there something in life that is worth going through all the stress and pain? And when you examine Christianity, it gives us a coherent answer to the big questions of life. Who am I? Where did I come from? Why am I here? How should I live? Where am I going after this? And through these answers that Christianity tells us, it provides us with the biggest purpose we can have in this life. Okay, I know purpose is a big topic. We can talk about many aspects about purpose. Okay, but today I just want to give all of us a framework of looking at the purpose that Christianity offers to us. Okay, and to do that, I want to refer us to a portion of a letter found in the Bible. Okay, let's read from Ephesians chapter 2. Sign for verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of this, His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, He might show the incomparable riches of His grace expressed in His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handy work, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. For God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay, today from this passage, I want to share with you three ways to live out the God-given purpose in your life. Are you guys ready? You guys ready? And okay, the first one is this, that we need to remember our past. Last week, Channel News Asia featured the story of an ex-Yakuza. Mr. Tatsuya Shindo joined a Yakuza gang at a young age of 17 after being talent scouted by the syndicate because he was, you know, he was, already, uh, he was already, already using drugs at, at a young age. Mr. Shindo was drawn to the criminal group not just because of their luxurious lifestyles, but also because the Yakuza fostered a sense of loyalty and brotherhood. But as he fell deeper into the Japanese underworld, Mr. Shindo learned 
the price of belonging was often paid in blood. He saw many people killed in power struggles. He saw how drug users died of intoxication. And he witnessed his own henchmen being stabbed to death. He himself was addicted to crystal meth. Okay, you watch Breaking Bad, right? Crystal meth. And was in and out of prison since the age of 22. By the time he was 32, he had been excommunicated by the Yakuza for spending about eight of 10 years as an inmate. His last stint in jail, however, proved to be a turning point. Mr. Shindo in, in, in prison saw how other convicts were reading the Bible, and he asked his wife, can you bring me one? And this is what he said, okay, and I quote, I became a convert after reading Ezekiel chapter 33, which says, I have no pleasure, that's God saying, in, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. And his life was transformed. He accepted God into his heart in prison. Okay, but despite his change in heart, life was hard after his release. Okay, the Japanese society is generally un unaccepting of ex-convicts. And the ex-Yakuza have a greater disadvantage because of their tattoos, right? The tattoos all over their body. So even when Mr. Shindo was able to secure odd jobs, he was not able to hold them down. Eventually, he managed to find his footing thanks to an understanding boss. Okay, and the story he shared is that one day, his boss walked in on him changing his shirt. And just when he thought that, oh my goodness, that's, that's it, I'm going to be fired, his boss said this to him, no wonder you work so hard. And it was a turning point, then that was a pivotal moment in his life. And that was the moment he decided to abandon, to put aside his self selfish way of life in the past and to live his life doing good to others. He enrolled himself into a Bible seminary and today, Mr. Shindo pastors a church called the Friends of Sinners Jesus Christ Church, okay, where he ministers to former gang members and parents of convicts. Mr. Shindo is able to experience such a powerful transformation and live a purpose-driven life precisely because he understood just how bad he was. And yet, God accepted him and people around him received him. Now, I know for most of us here, when we hear stories like this, right, convicts become converts, mobsters become ministers, we feel inspired. But honestly, we don't feel connected, right? We don't feel connected to the character in this story. Why? Because we assume that we are not bad like these people were. Okay, we generally can agree lah, that we are sinners, we are imperfect. You know, we have lustful thoughts, we are greedy, we are angry, but you know, we don't think of ourselves at the same level as criminals. And in our passage today, the Bible reveals a sobering truth about all of us. Okay, verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of, this, of the kingdom and, air, and of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also live among us live among them at one time, gratifying the craving of our flesh and following its desire and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Okay, over here, the Bible uses some of the strongest words to describe our condition before God. Okay, it says that we, that you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Okay, in the New Testament, the word dead, it, it's not just used to mean lifelessness. Okay, but also separated. Okay, it is like severing your relationship with somebody and telling him, you are as good as dead to me. Right? Whether he lives or dies, it does not matter to you anymore. And similarly, we were dead to God and separated from him because of our sins and transgressions. As a result, we are deserving of his wrath. Now, it is one thing for your girlfriend or wife to be upset with you, it is one thing for your boss to be disappointed in you, but it is a totally different thing altogether to 
stand in the wrath of God. Okay, perhaps at this point in time, some of you are thinking, especially our non-believing friends, are we really that bad? I mean, I know so many non-Christians who live morally upright lives that will put Christians to shame. How can you say that we are so sinful that we deserve God's wrath? Elsewhere in the Bible, it explains in greater details. In Romans chapter 1, verse 18, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Okay, what this short and very deep passage reveals is that we have sinned not simply because we have broken some rules, but because we have chosen to turn our back on our Creator. Instead of acknowledging Him, worshipping Him and giving thanks to Him for bringing us into existence, we chose to pledge our allegiance to something else okay, and live life apart from Him. Okay, like somebody who works with another country to betray his own, we have betrayed God. We have committed treason against Him. Okay, that's why we are dead to God and we are deserving of His wrath. Now, unless you acknowledge that your status before God is really no different from the worst criminal, okay, you will not see why the Christian message is such a great news. Okay, and for the Christians in our midst, unless you recognize just how wretched you were before God, you will not be able to find the power to live a purpose-driven life. Okay, you will think of living out God's purpose as as purely just a list of things that you need to do. Oh, I need to attend service, sell good regularly, I need to give, give to the king, I need to serve in the ministry. You think of purpose in purely in terms of just a list of things to do. You will try to fill out all your timetables, right? To do more things in church, but your heart will not be filled with that profound relief <sighs> yeah. that you have escaped your old life. So, that's the first way to live out a God-given purpose. Okay, remember your past. Never forget about it. Okay, and the second way that we can live out uh, the uh, God-given purpose in our life is to recognize your position. I am not a fan of musicals. I feel sleepy the moment the first character sings you know, in the show. Uh, I f when I watched Sound of Music, when I watched Frozen, I fell asleep within the first few minutes. Okay, I really let it go, man. Okay, but one scene from a musical that will always touch my heart and will always leave a deep impression in my mind is the exchange between Jean Valjean and Bishop Muriel in La Miserable. <laughs> The story is told of a man, John Valjean, a former convict who was released from prison after serving a 19 year sentence for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his sister's starving child. He struggled to find work and was rejected by society due to his criminal past. Valjean arrived in the town of Dean, where he was taken in by a kind-hearted clergyman, Bishop Muriel. The bishop trusted Valjean, fed him supper, and provided him with a bed for the night. However, during the night, Valjean's inner desperation reached a breaking point where he saw the bishop's collection of silver. And in his moment of impulse, he stole them and ran away. The next morning, the police brought the apprehended Valjean back to the bishop. Uh, we came across him. He was walking like a man who was running away. You know, he had this silver. Da, da. But before the policeman could finish that statement, the bishop interjected and explained that 
He was the one who gave, who had given the silverware to Valjean. Not just that, the bishop took two more silver candlesticks from his collection and gave them to Valjean in front of the police. Ah, before you go out, ah, here are your candlesticks. Valjean was overwhelmed with emotions. And right after the police left, the bishop said to Valjean, do not forget, never forget that you have promised to use this money in becoming an honest man. Okay, we love such redemption stories, don't we? Right? Especially when someone pays a high price for the sake of someone who is undeserving. And that is really the story arc of the Bible, except that it's not fictional, it is real. Okay, just like how he describes our condition before Christ, the Bible similarly uses some strong words to describe our position in Christ. Okay, let's read from verse 4 again. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness for us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Okay, notice the passage we just read. It tells us three things that God has already done for us through Christ. Okay, firstly, he made us alive with Christ. Okay, that's verse 5. He has raised us up with Christ. Verse 6, and you know, we didn't say verse, he has seated us with Christ. These things have already happened, past tense. Okay, firstly, instead of being spiritually dead and separated from God, we are now made alive. Okay, if you are Christians, you have been made alive. We have been reunited with God relationally. Secondly, we have been raised up with Christ. What that means is that His resurrection means that one day we will also be Resurrected too. Okay, death is no longer a full stop, but a comma right, in the story of our lives. And thirdly, we have been seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Okay, this one might not be so straightforward, right? Harder to understand. So let me give you a, an illustration. I used to work in a government statutory board, and one day my colleague asked me to help her to set up the boardroom for the chairman's lunchtime meeting. We, the both of us, we intentionally planned out the sitting arrangement for all the participants. We put up name tens on the table to direct them to their seat. We bought chicken rice and sliced fruit and we distributed you know, one set to every seat, right? just preparing the place. While we were setting up, I saw my colleague opening a container of chili and pouring it over a particular packet of chicken rice. Not just that, I also noticed for the specific seed, she put a cup of jelly instead of sliced fruit. Okay, so I was curious, right? I mean, that person, I mean, even the chairman is eating the same with the rest of the people. So what's so special? So I asked her, hey, why this one so special? Huh? And she explained, Oh, this one is for our own group director. If he arrives and sees that the chili is not poured over his rice, and he, if he sees that he's not given chili, uh, jelly, he will be really upset. <laughs> I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> I mean, I was like, well, really, you know, taken by surprise. So I told her, lah, I think you should also feed him. Lah. <laughs> okay, just think about the efforts and and intentions we put into honoring our human bosses, right? I mean, all of us working adults, we understand this, right? Let's think about the efforts, the intentions, and the initiatives we put into honoring our human bosses at work, right? They have, we, they have a special seat at a table. You don't make a boss sit at the corner of the room, right? They have a special seat at the table. Their personal room is located at the highest floor of the building and within the deepest part of the level. Do you see any boss seat at the door? Never, right? And likewise, if you are a Christian, something similar has happened for you. 
Okay, even though you're physically here, the Bible tells us that a special place has been reserved for you in heaven. The name 10 is already put up. Okay, and you'll receive something better than chicken rice and jelly. Okay, you are not going to be standing at the side of the room, nor will you be, be, be sitting at the back. You will be seated with none other than Jesus Christ himself. When you get to heaven, you will be ushered to your seat and you will be shown the incomparable riches of God's grace. Okay, of course, right now we, are think, we might be asking, what are those things, right? It's so, it's, it's so vague. Okay, but even though, we might, we, even though we might not know what those things are, one thing we can be sure, we will be showered with honour and glory. To all my Christian brothers and sisters, this is our position in Christ. When we understand this, when we remember this, when we interna- internalize this, okay, we will realize, we will come to a realization, ah, oh, we don't need to make it the pursuit and the purpose of our life to accumulate success and wealth. We don't have to stress about missing out in life. Okay, more importantly, our hearts will be so profoundly touched by how we deserve death, right, not too long ago in the passage, right? We deserve death, but we're given life instead. We will not want to live our lives for ourselves anymore. We will want to live our lives for the person, for the one who had made our salvation possible. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, for Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all that we and that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Christ took our cross so that he can put his crown on us. He took up our poverty so that we may receive his royalty. He died so that we might live. You see, living a purposeful life is not just, a, not just about the what to do but it's primarily about who are you living for. And I do not know of any other purpose that is greater than giving my life to love and serve Christ. Amen? Amen? And finally, the third way to live out the God-given purpose in our lives is to return to God's plan. I was not entirely happy working as a pastor during the first four years here. Okay, already not so, doesn't sound so good. Part of the reason was that I felt shortchanged to give up a career in the public sector to work in a you know, smaller organization. And these negative feelings started in the first year when I joined, in the, my first year here in church, when... Okay, this will sound absolutely silly to you, but this negative feeling started when Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un came to Singapore for the North Korea-United States Summit. Okay, I remember watching the live coverage on the news. Okay, when Kim and Trump took the center stage and shook hands, wow, I felt this sense of awe. Wow. Okay, just to clarify, uh, I, I, have no, I have zero admiration for these two men. <laughs> But I found myself drawn to the weightiness of this momentous event. It's a wow, this is such an epic moment. And I thought to myself, these exact thoughts, what a great time to work for the government ministries that put this event together. And it was later on that God spoke and revealed to me that I felt dissatisfied in my role not so much because I made great sacrifices, but because I had held my role with such low regard. Okay, I have been entrusted with the responsibility of leading precious lives. I have been given the privilege to teach the Word of God publicly, which will mean life or death. But yet, I treated my role as a demotion rather than a promotion. God spoke to me clearly then, okay, but that message did not sink into my heart immediately. Okay, eventually, most of you know that I resigned from Moreau. And it was only during the few months that I was back in the public sector that God's message and rebuke finally caught up to me and convicted me. 
I felt reassured about God's call upon my life, and I decided that there is nothing else that I would rather do for the rest of my life. Now, I know that many of you hearing this will not feel that you can identify with my story. Lah. Why? Because we have a tendency right, to think that only full-time church workers are called and chosen by God, okay, but not the lay people. Oh, I chose my course because that's the only course I can, I can, I can qualify for. I took out my current job because it's the only job that offers me. Lah. I stumbled upon what I'm doing right now. Man, there's nothing special about my story. I took up this job because I just want to make a lot of money. I don't think God has chosen me for anything. Okay, and in our passage today, it tells us that God not only, not only has, has not only changed the outcome of our lives, right, from death to life, but He also wants to change the orientation we live our lives. How do we, how do all of us live our life before Christ? Okay, let's read from verse 3 again. All of us also live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Okay, notice it does not... Okay, in other words, okay, what this passage is saying is that we, all of us, used to live self-centered lives. Okay, instead of having God on the throne of our hearts, instead of putting the Creator at the center of our lives, we put ourselves on the throne instead. Okay, we claim our independence from God, we wanted nothing to do with Him, and we wanted to live life as we please. But now, okay, if you are a Christian, now that we have been made alive and reunited with Him, God wants us to return to the plan He has prepared for us. Okay, we see this in verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Okay, notice it doesn't just stop at we were created in Christ Jesus to do good works. I think even if the writer had stopped there, the sentence will still make perfect sense. It continues with which God with which God prepared in advance for us to do. What this means is that God has not only saved you from from punishments, He has also saved you for a purpose. He has, God has not only saved you from punishment, He has also saved you for a purpose. Okay, once again, the gravity of this verse can be easily lost on us, right? Like how I, you know, I lost, I, I didn't see the importance of it in the early years of my pastoral journey. Okay, so let's try to understand this. Okay, you guys were really excited about the CEO analogy last week, so let's use it again, huh? Okay, imagine you work for an MNC, okay? Just think about the MNC in your mind, your favorite MNC. Your CEO flies to Singapore, right? Takes a 10 plus hours flight, a flight flies to Singapore. He comes to your office and he walks right up to your cubicle where you are, where you are. And he tells you straight, in, straight in, no, when he tells you straight in the face, you know, I've been thinking long and hard about you for the past few months. I have an important assignment a task that would determine the fate of the company. And I want you to take it up. How will you feel? How will you feel? Will you tell him, oh, I should know lah. You know, I just want a nine to five job. I don't want to be stressed. Eh. When you come all the way, you stress me lah. I don't want to be stressed. Eh. And I know I, I don't want to work overtime because I need self-care, you know. I'm happy where I am. So please, you know, please give this oh, task to somebody else instead. Will you say that? I guess some of you say yes, love. <laughs> but I think for, for the majority of us, myself included, I don't think so. Right? I think our hearts will be filled with, so, with such a deep, we will feel so privileged, we will feel such an honor. Wow, that somebody important has given me such an important task, he has entrusted me. Right? Maybe I might question, well, why me? Why not somebody else? But I think I will feel such deep you know, awe, such deep honour and privilege that an uh, important person has given me such an important task. You will treat this assignment with the utmost importance and dedication. And in the same way, yet much greater sense, God has already prepared a plan for you, an assignment that will change the fate of this world. 
Okay, we might not all be called to full-time church ministry, but our individual unique calling from God is every bit important to His purpose. How then should we live out our God-given purpose? Okay, one of the imageries of the, Christian, of, of the Christian life that the Bible often uses, and is one of my favorite as well, is that of running a race. Okay, for example, we see this in Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. The Christian life is likened to a race. Okay, God has prepared a, a plan for you. He has marked out a race for you. And how should we be running this race? How should we approach this race? Okay, Philippians, Philippians chapter 3, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me, heavenwards in Christ Jesus. Let me ask you, do runners look behind while running in a race? Do they do that? Okay, maybe you need to, maybe they, if they want to taunt their opponent, uh, BM them. Uh. But they won't, do, they won't do that. Of course not. They intentionally focus their attention and energy forward and strenuously work towards the finishing line. In this race, you are going to feel tired. In this race, you're going to feel stressed. You are going to feel pain all over. You will be tempted to, you will be tempted to give up. But you will not want to because the price at the end will be worth it. My friends, at the end of your life, what is the thing that you want to be able to say to yourself? Have you ever thought about it? What is the thing you want to be able to say to yourself? Is it, yeah, I was a millionaire before I died. I'm so glad that I traveled to every continent in the world. Yes, my children managed to make it to the Ivy League universities. Or, I have seen my grandchildren. Okay, I have no more regrets. What is, what is the one thing you want to be able to say to, your life, say to yourself? May I propose to you the best thing you can tell yourself at the end of your life? The best thing. Second Timothy chapter 4, I have fought the good fight. I finished the race. I kept the faith. Not just that. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for His appearing. There is no other achievement or accolade in this world that's better than this. This is worth living our entire lives for. For those, of, for those of us who are Christians, wherever you may be in your life right now, you are currently in this race. Okay, maybe you stop running. Lah. <laughs> you chill there, right? But you're in this race. You're already in the race. Would you choose to live out God's plan for your life and continue running this race with perseverance? Let me close. The words in 2 Timothy chapter 4, which, which we just read, I fought a good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith, were written by the Apostle Paul at the end of his life. Okay, the same person who wrote the letter to the Ephesians. And what is noteworthy is that Paul, great, great an apostle that, that he was, did not run this race alone. Okay, and we know this, right? Because in his letters, he frequently mentioned and honoured his fellow partners in the gospel. In the same way, all of us are running the same race together. Okay, we need each other's help and encouragement to get to the finishing line together. You know, in Brighton, we like to use the word journey. Right? We use that very often, right? Uh, let's journey together. We want to journey with you. Okay, it's a great word. Huh? I'm not saying we should, just, we should stop using it. But, you know, it does not quite capture. It does not capture the intensity of the Christian life. 
right? It does not capture the intensity of, of a race, right? In a race, you have to train yourself, you have to discipline yourself, you have to keep on going even when it's tough. You know, so the word journey don't quite capture that. Maybe we need to include the word run right, in our vocabulary. Okay, the life centered on God's purpose will still be stressful. <laughs> the life cent- there's, there's centered on God's purpose will still be painful, but it will all be worthy at the end. And it will be a lot easier if we do this together. Amen? Okay, so can, so can you help me tell a neighbor beside you? Let's run together. Come, shall we stand? You guys are excited about running. Okay, let's pray. Father, we give thanks to you for this amazing privilege to be called your children, to be honored, to be made alive with Christ, to be raised up along with Christ and to be seated with Him, O oh God. Lord, at this moment, Lord, we want to remember our condition before Christ, that we are wretched sinners, condemned, hopeless, deserving of your wrath, O oh God. And God, I just want to pray for all of us here, that even as we, in, we remember our past, God, you will begin to fill our hearts with such a profound gratitude, a profound appreciation, O oh God, for our Christian identity. And I pray, O oh God, you help us to feel what an honour it is, O oh God, to be used by you, to be chosen by you, to be thought, to be, to be, to be, to be thought about by you, and to be given this task for your purpose in this world, God. So, God, I just want to pray, Lord, let us never belittle our our Christian identity and calling. Let us never treat them with low regard. I pray that God, each and every day, Lord, help us to always just bring us back, oh God, to this wonderful truth. And I pray that, Lord, even as we live out this God-given purpose in our life, and Lord, you'll just begin to help us to see, you know, the stresses in our lives, the pains, the difficulties, they're all worth it. They're all worth it because it will be, because the price at the end of the line will be worth it. And I want to just want to pray for all of us here that God may be the ambition of our life, the motto of our life, to say we want to complete the race. We want to continue to fight the good fight. And the Lord, we can look forward to the day that we can say to ourselves and to you that I've fought the good fight, I've finished the race, I've kept the faith. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.